I'm here with my friend Quinn Williams. Uh, Quinn, how you doing? Doing great. How about yourself? Uh, doing pretty good. And um, I guess before we get started, uh, I guess I'd like you, you to introduce yourself to everybody. Um, I guess tell everyone how you came to uh, have an interest in Nietzsche and what about Nietzsche's ideas really hooked you in. Yeah, absolutely. So I'm essentially coming to Nietzsche out of a background in art and design, and uh, specifically just how that design relates to communication. Um, from there, I ended up going from studying things about art and art direction to color psychology to just psychology in general and the way that relates to identities and things like that that are put forward toward the public. I found myself with an interest in uh, the work of Carl Jung, which I spent some time on, um, and from there kind of moved into um, moved into kind of studying Nietzsche around the time I was reading Psychological Types. I picked up Zarathustra, and just generally speaking, my interest in Jung started to wane, and, uh, and uh, kind of Nietzsche took over in that sense. And uh, Well, so wait, I have a question. Did you yeah. read... Uh, Jung's commentary on Zarathustra before you read this book, Zarathustra? I did not. I read Zarathustra first, and I don't have a background in philosophy. Uh, my background is more like, like I said, in uh, in art, um, art communication, psychology as kind of a lay person, and from there um, into philosophy. And so I'm really, I really almost started with Nietzsche as far as philosophy goes. It feels like you're going on an adventure with Nietzsche. It's very yeah. like joyous. You mentioned art, communication, and psychology. Mm -hmm. um, so I guess where what was the aspect of Nietzsche's work that was sort of the one that drew you in? Um, I would probably say art first and foremost, um, having not really known a whole lot about Nietzsche and just kind of knowing about um, Nietzsche's influence on Jung. I just basically picked up Zarathustra without any recommendation on where to start with Nietzsche whatsoever. Um, I think the uh, the Zarathustra's prologue, I, end up, I ended up reading probably 10 times before I moved through the rest of it just to get a sense of what the language was like and, and kind of like getting into the, po the poetic aspect of it, which is, I guess, what sort of opened up philosophy as an interesting field for me as someone who was much more interested in art prior to that. Yeah, well, you also probably can't. <laughs> I don't know if you can really uh, glean the contents of Zarathustra's prologue until you've read it at least 10 times. Yeah. So we're going to talk about um, something today, uh, the Time Atomism Fragment, or Time Atom Fragment, from 1873. So it's part of the Nachlass, the Unpublished Notes. 1873, that's you know right after Birth of Tragedy, so really early in Nietzsche's career. Um, and that kind of has a sense to it, though, because I guess the first thing I would say about the Time Atom Fragment is that the issues that Nietzsche is concerned with, um, which you could say is like, you see the problem of motion in there, like, it's the kind of thing that concerned Parmenides and Heraclitus, right? And right. so there's a, it's a decidedly, like, pre- I don't want to say necessarily pre-Platonic uh, specifically, but like it reads like natural philosophers of antiquity, <laughs> that kind of, <laughs> those same kind of concerns, right? Um, yeah. But the style is really, I don't know, because it's an unpublished note. It's like super condensed, um, right? And, and right around this time, we have. Uh, sorry, if I cut no, 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 go on. Uh, Right around this time, we have um, af after Birth of Tragedy, we have his writings on the his lectures that he gave on the pre-Platonic philo uh, philosophers. Um, about at the same time, let's see, Untimely Meditations came out. Um, so I definitely feel like this is where, out of his philology background, he's coming into becoming a philosopher on his own by revisiting the pre-Platonics and uh, also considering the world. Um, on his own in response to that. So what you're getting here and in the in the pre-Platonic philosophers lectures is kind of Nietzsche is most metaphysical before you have like the critiques of metaphysics and human all too human and all those things. Yeah, it's 
I was kind of searching for a word to not say metaphysics to describe it, but it, <laughs> yeah. it is that. Like, you can't really... Um, and because, I mean, he's... When you're making statements like um, talking about... I mean, he talks about being here um, mm -hmm. and the impossibility of representing non-being. Like, when you make right. a statement like that, you're, you're in met metaphysical territory, basically. Absolutely. Um, and I think understanding Nietzsche from the perspective of his take on metaphysics is essential to understanding why he rejects metaphysics as well. Okay, so how do we want to do this? Do we want to like go section by section or um... Yeah, I think I think that will be one of the best ways to start. I mean it really has to I, I feel like the best approach toward this is kind of like I'll I'll sort of give some things that I think are keys to interpreting it. And then from there, um, we can kind of think through it. I have some writing on it already that's still being worked out because it gets a little hairy near the end. Um, yeah. <laughs> yeah, yeah. But uh, but definitely, uh, definitely, uh, we have some ways of interpreting it. So I'll lead through that if you're if you don't mind. Yeah. One of the reasons that we're talking about something that's so hard to conceive um, is that this, like like you said, like this really starts out from talking about being and things like that. So you have to be in a space where you're really open to philosophical considerations and uh, and starting points and epistemologies. And um, there's a, I don't know if he's a philosopher or a professor, um, Alistair Moles. He wrote a book called Nietzsche's Philosophy of Nature and Cosmology. And he basically said, uh, let's see, I quote, uh, as a theory of time, uh, his Nietzsche's time atom theory is so radical that there is no precedent with which to make a useful comparison, at least in the philosophic tradition of the Western world. And so with that statement, um, we definitely know what kind of territory we're getting into. That's a what I, I love that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's exactly what it feels like when you're reading through it. So, um, yeah, I think uh, fragment, what is it, 20, the book is 26 and the fragment is 11. Um, Starts out, I have nothing but sensation and representation. Um, Empfindung as uh, sensation. It's also like sentience and emotion. Um, so, and then uh, forced along is like representation, as in Arthur Schopenhauer's world is Villa und Vorstellung, um, which is kind of what is represented from sensation. I don't know if you want to give a little bit more about that since you've covered that on previous podcasts. Yeah. Well, it's, I mean, the, the key thing, um, as I would see it, well, it's sort of what he says in the next line. Um, I cannot think these as having arisen from the contents of, of representation, mm -hmm. um, as in sensation and representation themselves cannot have, <laughs> cannot themselves be representations like yeah. the faculty of representation or the faculty of sensation, you might say. Schopenhauer basically makes that argument right at the beginning of World as Will and Representation. This mm -hmm. Actually, this beginning chunk is the easiest part for me because when you reach... You can see where he's coming from if you read Schopenhauer. Um, I think they actually quoted in this copy of the Time Adam fragment in a footnote. Oh yeah, mm -hmm. uh, Schopenhauer says, quote, that the world is my representation is a truth valid for every living and knowing being, although man alone can bring it to, into reflective abstract consciousness. He does not know a sun and an earth, but only an eye that sees a sun, a hand that feels an earth, end quote. And that also, I think, uh, another informative quotation is from his essays where he uh, it says, on the essay is on the difference between the thing in itself and appearance. And he says, just as we uh, know the earth only by the broad contours of the surface, not the great solid masses of the interior, that is analogous to the difference between how we know the world through representation versus the quote-unquote true world or the noumenal world. Um, now, Nietzsche isn't bringing up like a true world here, but I think um, it's very clear that from the second line, his representations, the way he's using it here, are, as you said, they're just presentations of the thing. They're not the thing itself, to use that dirty word. Mm -hmm. um, which is why uh, the faculty of sensation and the faculty of representation can't themselves be representations. And I think Nietzsche even makes that point in Beyond Good and Evil. Um, that, mm -hmm. our, if our percept, that our organs themselves can't be the productions of our organs. Right, um, right. Yeah. 
Yeah, absolutely. So I think one of the major things in that sense when we're thinking about this is that, um, you know, sensation representation is um, a direct, uh, is directly related to his critique of the will in uh, Beyond Good and Evil, section 19, where the will is not only a complex of sensation and thinking, but above all an emotion, and in fact, the emotion of command. So will is not so much this choice-making entity as this process of uh, receiving receiving sensations and uh, and then them being represented afterward. Mm. Yeah, so there's it's very specifically, I, I think he chose sensation and representation specifically with his reevaluation of the will coming well, the out of Schopenhauerian philosophy. Only two aphorisms later than in 21, that's where he gives his critique of free will and unfree will. And so you can mm-hmm. see in the way he's thinking about things there how so many of his aspects of his philosophy are all related that if you take out that sort of mystical free will element that Mm -hmm. is often implicit in our thinking, we don't even think about how it affects (laughs) our approach to the world. Um, If you take that out, or if that's not there, then the will would become like, like he says, a system of command, right? Mm -hmm. Um, You get this sensation and then, you um, have this sort of, you get the stimulus and then a, a reaction to it, basically. Right. Yeah. And from that arrives later the doer and the deed, which he talks about not being a thing. <laughs> right. But yes, the doer is merely a fiction of the deed. Right. So right. That's almost too far for me, but I love that line. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, yeah, that's that's out there, but that's I feel like this is the same place he's coming from in this fragment. So of course we have I cannot represent non-being. Well, he, we cannot think anything that is not sensation and rep- representation. Uh, so no pure existence of time, space, world, um, if without that which senses and represents. Um, so it's really interesting when he talks about that which is and that which is not in the following lines. It's I feel it's really important that he's using das Sienda and not um, das Sein, right? Because when he says that Heraclitus will remain eternally right, that being is an empty fiction in uh, Twilight of the Idols, he's saying that Sein is an, uh, is an empty fiction. And Sein is the to be. Uh, form of the verb, and Sienda is the um, participle. And without getting too far into that, we're talking. He's talking about the what's usually considered the quality of existence pertaining to a thing. He's talking about particular beings considered together, rather than like a kind of like being itself. Um, right. So, to interject yeah. quickly here, that mm-hmm. also is something he talks about in the pre-Platonic lectures. As um, mm-hmm. and I'm trying to remember the name of the actual figure, um, but to where you eventually that there is a separation made between this idea of a unitary being versus mm-hmm. beings as sort of like a series of monads, um, right. And but that's also that idea is covered in that lecture, and also the the idea that there is no pure existence of space time and the world without that which sense, senses and represents, also found in world as well and representation, um, mm. which he covers as like the principle of sufficient reason. That basically it's a um, it's through our um, uh, what would you say through our bringing our representations of the world um, be before our, uh, what would you say, mind's eye or something like that, that we are mm-hmm. perceiving these patterns and laws, but that right. uh, the will, since the will itself for Schopenhauer is like this, it can't be described by time or it can't be divided into individual beings. None of those categories could possibly apply to it. Um, mm-hmm. I think Nietzsche is actually going a little further here though than Schopenhauer right. would. Because he basically says that which is, is all of those individual like phenomena of sensation and representation. Um, right. They can't be separated from the act of perceiving. Right. It's like that. It's very Heraclitian again of mm-hmm. that it's in the um, emergence or the or shining, you know, of uh, the mm-hmm. appearance um, that something is. Right. So all of yeah. this stuff, I think, is is 
the easiest part of the fragment. Mm-hmm. Yeah, yeah. It, it's definitely, uh, it's definitely. I feel like it's important to kind of comb over as the setup because twenty six gets a little wild. Um, I think that the probably the last most important part of this first passage is the uh, the statement that matter is itself only given as sensation, and any conclusion beyond that is not permitted. Sensation and representation are the reason that we believe in causes, impulses, and bodies. And that these can be traced back to movement and numbers. Yeah, it's so like I'm not materialist sure. agnosticism. Mm-hmm. And um, I never knew that that's what I was until I started reading some of these passages from Nietzsche where I was like, right. I, it's, it's not quite... Um, and it really has to be agnosticism, as he's saying, because any mm-hmm. conclusion beyond that is not permitted. Right. Right. Yeah, and what we're going to get here is uh, um, is definitely a kind of materialism, but the material is time. So that's yes. <laughs> that's where we're really uh, <laughs> kind of breaking away from a materialist tradition. Yeah, um, I guess I'm trying to think if there's anything else I'd want to say about this this first section. Um, mm-hmm. The re- well, he, one interesting part: the representing can neither think of itself as having become nor as passing away. Um, right which which is sort of like okay and it just in the form of like a truism you might just say like psychologically Mm -hmm. we can't you you could appeal to people's inability to conceive of non-entity nothingness um right their consciousness not existing and Mm -hmm. that might be good enough actually just to to cover it i think he's saying something maybe a little bit deeper there but i think you can it's almost more intuitive and the the representing yeah, the representing thinks of itself as being. Right. Okay. Being as in it 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 thinks it is, right? It thinks it is, whereas um as per his coverage of I think Parmenides in uh in the pre-Platonic philosophers, we're talking about when we're talking about that which is and how that that which is is, technically speaking, that which was and that which will be are not so they belong to non-being and time and change are impossible so they must be an illusion right yeah um well and and it's i've always thought of parmenides as sort of that what's driving him is a desire to um just do away with the the problem of motion i would just be like oh well there is no motion (laughs) right (laughs) problem solved um but yeah it also yeah deals yeah. with it has an interesting effect on what what you think about what truly is yeah. um it cannot be but it seems right that's where the appearance right. is an illusion the experience is what's denied by the philosopher the and and the bodily is kind of how nietzsche puts it in uh in pre-platonic philosophers the philosopher's goal is to in a sense um kind of divest themselves from the senses to find what is and is eternally at least up until Nietzsche's point <laughs> and that all right. that all relates to his his concepts of like being you know like how how let's see if if what was and what will be are not and yet becoming seems to happen it must be a lie and so what Nietzsche ends up coming up with is kind of the reverse of that Right, that it, um, be- becoming is the only reality, and mm-hmm. all of your um, concerns about anything outside of the immediate, um, what would you say, your immediate experience of the becoming are s- like your fiction on top of it, your conscious gloss on reality. Right. Um, yeah, well, do, uh, do we want to try and, and move to 26, uh, section 12? Yeah. Absolutely. So I think that was a good setup, um, especially what we're going to get in here is going to be akin to um, one of Zeno's paradoxes. Um, so we're definitely going to be talking about how when you consider a moment in time, uh, motion cannot be happening in that moment specifically, um, which is which is very similar to what we were just saying. Um, and that's that's like the paradox of the arrow, I believe. So, he starts out with two points, and they are labeled A and B. So, he says, space point A affects space point B, and vice versa. This requires a time, for every effect has to cover, uh, has to cover a distance. 
successive time points would merge together. So in just at the outset, we have two space points, and then he's talking about a time point. So um, those two space points make up the time point in a sense, right? So if you have two points in space, there really is no time in that moment, and he's calling that moment in which A and B exist time point one. Right. right? And so, yeah. so let's see. Um, yep, there's no time at a given time point. A time point is itself uh, something like a total consideration of spatial unity then, right? So the fact that they are existing together in space is a representation of time at that moment. I th- yeah, I think I'm with you on that. Um, yeah. In so far as, <laughs> what would you say? Until something, because we haven't introduced m- movement at this point. We've right, just sort of established two uh, points in space at the same moment in time. Mm-hmm. Without yep. movement, uh, there's really no way to uh, introduce time into it. And it, in some sense, our representation of that situation requires movement in order for time to even be, um, for it to, to emerge. Does that, is that kind of where, where, where we're at? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, just starting from this, starting from this basic point, it's just in the uh, thought experiment he's setting up, so far it's timeless. You're only considering A and B as those points. Um, so... But he wants to introduce the fact that A might affect B and vice versa. So we're talking kind of like about force in a certain sense. But I guess the part that ends up being hard is that he gives the explanation of this idea that successive time points merge together in the next section, right? So when he says that with its effect, A no longer impacts on B of the first moment, what does this mean? B still exists and A still exists too when they meet. Um, man, you know what? Actually, I I should cut out some of this to make it a little bit simpler because reading through this, I guess, is what the problem is. Well, um, <laughs> hold on, no, I, yeah, I, I protest actually because I think that okay. um, when you read that, I actually that clicked with me more than it has um, okay before seeing that as an explanation of successive time points merged together because what he's right. saying is so you have moment one and you have moment two in moment mm-hmm. one a and b are existent but they're not affecting each other in right. moment two a is impacting b but mm-hmm. i think he's raising the question it's, what does this mean bill b still exists and a exists too when they first meet i think he's raising right. that question to say that can't be true Right. Because yeah. the A is impacting on the B of the second moment. Um Right. Yep. That's exactly that's exactly how uh how I think of it. Right. Okay. So you have A and time point one, which would be like A one and B would be B one. Right. And then right. as the force is traveling, because it has to cover a distance, A one is becoming A two, A three, A four, right? But in the intervals between those, you would have like a 1.25, 1.025, etc. Like ad infinitum. Right. right. It's not exactly... Ending up in all of those... I was going to say, he hasn't exactly brought up Zeno's paradox as Zeno raises it. It's almost like... He's, he's almost saying qualitatively what Zeno said quantitatively. Um, which I think yes. is a good explanation. But he's just sort of saying, yep. well, where, where do they meet? Right? Right. I could, I could read the next part, actually, because he says that would mean, above uh, all, that A remains unchanged at this and that time point, but then A is not an effective force. Um, for this cannot remain the same, for that would mean it had not been effective. Right. Um, if A had not changed at all, nothing happened. Right. So it couldn't have <sighs> been effective. <laughs> so, Okay. <laughs> And so, yeah, then the next line, I think, actually is explanatory, because he says, if we take Mm -hmm. that which has an effect in time, then that which is effective in the smallest moment in time is distinct. Right. Um, Yeah. Actually, I was following along with that until I got to the end. Okay. Um, So, here, let me read read a section that I wrote on that part. Um, so, So what he's saying is, the more effective a force is, the less time points it takes to like achieve its effect, right? Okay. So if if a force is released at A one and like let's say impacts B seven, right? But the force from B one impacts A three. Force B was the more effective force. 
Right, because it took less time points. Right, okay. That seems, uh, like, logically coherent to me. Right, and, and that also makes it more distinct, right, as, as something that's being sensed. Hmm, okay. Is kind, of, yeah. is kind of the point. So, like, with gravity, right, gravity is one of the most persistent, uh, quote-unquote, forces, and also least distinct. Right, it's because um, we're talking about gravity in terms of gravity being the same thing fundamentally because everything is time. Uh, gravity is the fu- is fundamentally the same thing as the things which are affected by gravity, but they're just experienced with different levels of distinctness. Right, so right. it's the it's the this is also very mm-hmm. similar to Schopenhauer, I think, because he, yeah. he specifically references gravity as being. Um, sort of like the manifestation of the will that is like least defined and most general. And then as you get to people, mm-hmm. they're sort of the, for Schopenhauer, the most um, rarefied um, representation of the will because right. every person is like their own, uh, you know, you look at like an ant or other life forms, like the mm-hmm. arch, Plato's, uh, you know, archetypal form of the ant actually makes makes sense with a species like that, right? Um, right. You, they're all just sort of uh, copies on a pattern. You, then you get up to humans, and each one of them could basically be their own archetype or their own form because we have all these um, rarefied, complex desires, right? Uh, whereas, right. like, when you scale down to something like gravity, where it's like a blind, distributed force that's everywhere all at once, it's mm-hmm. constantly straining, but it's not really... Um, you know, it's not any stronger or more distinct anywhere else than it is in any other place. Um, right. Now, I guess you get into like quantum physics. That might not be true, but whatever. Yeah. <laughs> we're going to, we're going to skip some of that, but, yeah. uh, but, but yeah. So, I mean, that would even be like atmospheric pressure or something like that in comparison to like the, uh, the flash, like a flash of lightning, which you might describe as like roaring and like white hot. Right. It's moving like it moving more quickly and being more effective in time is what's making it uh, per- uh, be perceived more distinctly is kind of like what Nietzsche. I think that's a one saying. very descriptive way to put it or very yeah. explanatory. Yeah. OK. And then uh, with gravity being like a, a very weak force in that sense as well, um, under under general relativity, the like it's not described in terms of force anymore, but actually in curvature. So it's like shape and form mm. and like essentially like it's being represented. I actually to a, a brief aside on that, um, mm-hmm. in the com the YouTube comments to the video I did on Schopenhauer, there was a guy who was like, yeah. gravity's not a force, by the way. And I was like, well, <laughs> right. this was written in like 1820 or like, so yeah, yeah. Cut, you can cut him a break for that. Yeah. I think. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Gravity actually gets, um, Termed in for, uh, let's see, in um, gets actually put in terms of being and like understood that way, like as, in accordance with its like spatial shape, rather than its uh, its temporal effect in the way that mm. we're describing here. Right. Yeah. And it's this is totally blasphemous thing to say, but I I do feel that there are so many metaphysical assumptions baked into the way a lot of people think about Mm -hmm. um, modern science um not necessarily scientists themselves but a lot of them sure i mean people Mm -hmm. everyone fashions their own metaphysics as Kant says um after their own and uh, so it's like i think there's a naivete where people imagine that scientists themselves i mean nietzsche himself talks about this um Mm -hmm. like they're actually just dispassionate like truth seekers and they're not actually um they don't have any metaphysical or moral suppositions, right, in their research, which I don't think is true. But I think that's that is very interesting, though, that it's like we've kind of pivoted to describe gravity in terms of being. Where I always thought of gravity, or the way it was taught to me, and this is totally qualitative. I have no math. Is that it was a property of objects with mass, and when you think about right. it in that way, just like grammatically speaking, mm-hmm. it kind of leads you to think of gravity a different way that it's it's not something that is existing independently as this like force like a i don't know it's very interesting how we call these things laws too the law of gravity right like you right psychologically i from what i the conversations we've had i know you have a field day with that one and what that yeah (laughs) how we think about the world 
a law of nature that we derived, you know? I don't... I, yeah. It's a law in a certain sense, but the law applies to our derivation of the law as much as it applies to the thing we're deriving it from. That's, I guess, that's kind of a... Synonymous in my mind, at least, with what we were saying earlier about the um, the phenomenon, uh, which we might have said as like um, object or whatever is experienced. Right, the phenomenon is not inseparable from the sensation of it, um, which is just a very a very Nietzschean point in general. Right. Well, and it's also very Christian to think to conceive of the world as like it's a fundamentally like teleologically ordered place. Right, um, right. Where there yes, are like yes. just where matter is sort of like told what to do. Um, where right. it's like the speed of light is like a cosmic speed limit. You hear people talk about that, even like perfectly secular scientists, right? And they're still conceiving mm -hmm. of it as like a divine law. Um, right. You know, I, I know they're meaning it just as an expedient explanation, but mm -hmm. that's revealing to me. Okay. So where are we at in here? Um, oh, this next line, which is like, <laughs> it's a doozy. Where Nietzsche mm -hmm. says, um, with everything we've been talking, the s sections we were talking about before, he says, this means time proves the absolute non-persistence of a force. And he has right. absolute non-persistence uh, emphasized. Yeah. Yeah. The thing, uh, I guess here, um, this is like the thing that most makes a force a force is, uh, I guess, in this context that we're talking about it at least, um, to hedge a little is its effect that it's having for the for its effect and therefore also its distinctiveness to be well to be effective it has to be it has to not persist right the persistence means that it's not effective as per uh, the line above but then a is not an effective force because it cannot remain the same right so that which remains the same is and persists is non-effective and kind of like a non-force then, right? So force itself does not persist, absolutely. Right, it's... It, it has a sense to it in terms of what we were talking about earlier with the, you know, like the flash of lightning, for example, right? Mm -hmm. You're saying that's a lot of, you know, uh, energy expelled in a very short period of time, which is what makes it distinct. Yes. Um, but a flash of lightning is there and, and then gone. Um, because mm -hmm. it's... Uh, and you could say that with all all phenomenal things that uh, we experience are, even though, as he points out at the beginning, none of us can represent to ourselves the representing thing arising and passing away. That's what we perceive with every distinct thing that we encounter, is it's arising and passing away. Mm -hmm. um, and so if something, what would you say, if something just persists at all times and doesn't arise and pass away, then it's... Um, it's not perceived or it's never distinct. Would that be another way to put it? Or... Yeah, it's and it's ineffective. Okay, yeah, it's, right. it doesn't uh, work. Uh, all laws of space are therefore thought as timeless. That means they must be simultaneous and immediate. Here's a little, I'll just uh, I'll just read uh, read what I had been writing on this part. Uh, so the so-called laws of space are best described um, as Sorry, best describe that which is most stable. And to call them laws is to think of them as eternal or immutable, consequently immobile and without force, dead, and everywhere at once, thus lacking perceptual intensity. Uh, they pertain to the consideration of absolute space, or being, uh, in which time and motion play no role. Since at least the time of the Greeks, the uh, philosophers have attempted to explain the world in its entirety, even to the point of denying the occurrence of motion, except as a sensory deception. Right, so that's where Nietzsche says in the next part, the whole world at a stroke, right, um, and by that whole world at a stroke, he means in some sense or another the true world, right, um, and is the world as it is represented in an infinite moment of spatial unity, absolutely persisted, uh, absolutely persistent, subject to eternal laws, and not subject to arising and passing away in time, uh, which belongs to mere appearance as opposed to immortal truth. <laughs> Right. <laughs> but then there is no movement, which is right. interesting. So it's like, uh, wow. Yeah, I, I don't know if uh, everyone in the audience will be, be with you on that. But for me, I think everything you explained makes sense to me. And it, it reminds me of in the pre-Platonic lectures when he's talking about um, the um, 
thought experiment of von Bayer and pulse rates. Mm -hmm. Right. Just to recap briefly on that, that um, if we were to, because they basically, oh, the neo-Kantian scientists and philosophers of science, because they had this new framework for thinking about the world in which our sense organs, which represent the world to us, or give us the data that our brains use to represent the world, uh, are not themselves the actual, you know, they're not, it bears no relationship to the quote-unquote actual true world, so therefore studying the different sense organs of different animals um, or whatever has a sense organ, right, could therefore inform us as to, you know, we, we could gather empirical data in the spirit of that new like way of looking at the world, right, and learn about the faculty of representation um, or draw general conclusions about it, I suppose. And what von Bayer was saying was that uh, they had noticed a a, or they had extrapolated a connection between pulse rate and the perception of movement or perception of time, um, such that something which I, I think I think I have the relationship correct. It might be reversed from this, but it, that if you were to speed up a human being's pulse rate, um, then you know the seconds would tick by, or no, if you were to speed up our pulse rate, um, that we were perceiving everything that much faster. Um, it would be that, uh, yeah, the seasons would tick by, uh, he says like the, the sun in the sky would be like the glow of a, an ember that one twirls around in a circle to, um, you know, give the illusion that it's actually a circle, but it's actually just a single point of fire. Um, that's how the sun would appear to us in the sky. It's just a band, um, you know, with everything, with our perception of motion being that quick that, that basically, if we could imagine speeding up our pulse rate to like 10,000 times what it is now, or slowing it down, cutting it by into one ten thousandth, um, you would perceive an entirely different world. Like if you were in an incredibly slow reality where, you know, flowers and mushrooms that sprout up overnight would seem like to be as, you know, immortal as anything. <laughs> it's like, you know, a mm -hmm. ancient mountain or something like that. Um, I don't know if that's the best explanation of those, uh, that thought experiment, but Nietzsche talks about it in his Heraclitus lectures. So basically they, how the perception of time that we have um, is completely perspectival. You do have these differences that we can observe with, say, smaller animals, like small mammals, insects, things like that, um, are actually having a different, quote-unquote, according to what we can empirically gather, a different uh, sort of subjective experience of the, the passage of time. So, you know, Nietzsche just imagines, along with von Baer, what if you could increase that to such a great degree, which our science couldn't possibly do, or our physiology couldn't possibly handle, but you could, there's no reason in principle why you couldn't, um, just to sort of like bring out that aspect. I, I think that's great. I think that's great. Also with the, uh, with, the, with the laws of space being thought as timeless and also simultaneous and immediate in that sense, one way of thinking about this is like, when we call them laws, we say that they're unchanging, right? And in a certain sense, we arrive back at like the beginning of this thought experiment where we're looking at two points in space and nothing is moving, right? We could say that it's a law that those, like that those uh, two points A and B describe kind of like the law of A and B, right? That will never change. Um, and so in one way where we imagine that we have captured the whole world at a stroke is in a, kind of like a network of these laws um or these uh these unchanging things and so as we're considering like time point one being the space of a and like a and b occupying the same space at the same time the more of these uh the more of these space points are under consideration the more we feel like we've captured the whole yeah, well, I know, I know what you mean, where you're saying, okay, so we have it, it's hard to conceive of in, in general terms of, right. you have this moment in time with object A and object B, mm -hmm. but um, like there's the old um, logical syllogism, um, I've heard it used to kind of draw out the problem of induction of like, you know, the sun will rise tomorrow. Um, I know this because the sun rose yesterday, therefore the sun will rise, you know, the future will be like the past, and therefore the sun will rise tomorrow. Um, and you could say insofar as, what would you say, like, the current gravitational orientation of Earth and the sun, where uh, we're at like a certain distance and we're in a certain orbit that is relatively stable, um, you know, that can last for like 5 billion years. 
And if all of our lives are occurring uh, and we're beings with that certain pulse rate, that certain rate of movement, right? The rate of the internal movement of your bodily fluids, kind of speed at which you're operating at in existence. We're at this certain speed and, you know, because of our faculties, we can even represent things to ourselves from way before our own time through things like history and, you know, the records that we keep. And so we have this and through science, right? But still in our, in our actual experience, it's like the sun will always rise tomorrow. And that can be true for 5 billion years. Um, so it's not something where there's no movement happening, but it's sort of like where you have a stable system, right? Mm -hmm. um, it's like the status quo is this form of movement. Um, now that will change one day, right? So it's not actually a law that the sun will rise tomorrow. That is the answer to that, <laughs> like, right. you know, that right. syllogistic problem is like, yeah, you're right. Eventually, there is no guarantee that the future will be like the past, and a day will come where the sun will not rise for whatever reason, because the Earth's fallen into it, or it's getting thrown out into space, or the sun went supernova, or whatever the fuck happens. For all intents and purposes, in our experience of it, it's like that seems like a stable thing, like a law. And before we had a conception based on like advanced astronomy to know about things like gravitational orbits and things like that for vast majority of people that would be seen as like the closest thing to a quote unquote law right if you're an egyptian mm -hmm. like yep. that's a law like yeah Ra rises in the morning right he <laughs> rises chariot across the sky and that's what always happens and so yeah it's it's the laws end up being like a reification of uh just something that's always been the same for the moment of time that we exist in um, yeah, I guess we could move to the next lines um, where he says, Movement labors under the contradiction that it is constructed according to the laws of space and makes those very laws impossible through the assumption of a time. It is and it is not at the same time. Here we can help by assuming that either space or time equals zero. Which... <laughs> This is where we're getting to the time atomism replacing materialism. Right. What is it? Our perception of movement uh, labors under the laws of space, but makes those laws impossible through the assumption of time. Because I guess as he's shown, we don't ever have a, we don't ever have a colliding, a one colliding with B one. Mm -hmm. um, right. Okay. Is that it? Yeah. Or it yeah, uh, I think one of the one of the keys here is like when he talked about the opposition between not uh, like not like an actual opposition, but when he defined the dichotomy between sensation and representation in the prior fragment, um, sensation and representation in some sense are what does he say? He they reduce back to movement and numbers. Let me see. So the laws of space here are also being associated with numbers rather than movement, and so. I guess one of the uh, sort of more colloquial ways that you see that put is um, when people say things like uh, like math is the language of reality, right? <laughs> right. Right. Yeah. So um. So yeah. So uh. So that's that is thinking of things in terms of of being like of reality, right? It's it is uh, bound up with numbers, well, maybe even we in should... the sense that. Oh, yeah. Sorry, maybe we should bring in kind of what he says elsewhere about that, that um, what it, that um, numbers always depend on the equation of unequal things. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And so this numerical representation, he does actually think that in the most fundamental sense, it is false. Yes, like that being is an empty fiction of the world. Yeah, yep. And that being is an empty fiction. You know, and even in the like a uh, Neoplatonic sense, when we're talking about um, when we're when we're talking about being, or you know, sort of this uh, this principle of oneness and like the one, for example, from which um, other like other beings are derived, which is essentially a way of trying to think out if everything belongs to the whole, how does multiplicity exist? Right. From yeah. from the standpoint of unity. Right. And so like like at the at the how do I put this at the top level of these kinds of considerations, you have this uh, this very like even Heracleitean notion that like all is one. 
Yeah. And and there's a certain sense in which that literally means one, and like it's it's numerical, and becomes a question of how does or let me let me how change do, do gears not? slightly from appearances and the consideration of appearances. It's a matter of consideration that all things are one, right? That's something that's not necessarily apparent in everyday experience, and from the, those appearances. A whole is thought, right? Like, like the oneness of everything is thought. And from there, it changes from appearance into a, like a numerical calculation. Yeah, it's, um, it's really interesting because this is, this is like a problem that like beguiles Eastern um, philosophy. So like, you know, like one of the classic problems that the Christians were always arguing about for like mm -hmm. hundreds of years is the nature of the Trinity with their right. one God, right? Um, in the East, I feel like maybe something that is very similar, that it, it's kind of the same issue, right, of what you're talking about with Platonism, is like mm -hmm. in non-dualistic traditions, which is a very funny name if you think about it. Like mm -hmm. Non-dual. Right. Um, which immediately sets up a dualism between <laughs> dualistic systems of thought and our non-dualistic right. system. Um, and it's like, in order to even conceive of the idea of something being non-dual, non you have to conceive of the idea of is and is not. Mm -hmm. um, and so it's, it's not even, it's, it's like almost like meta-ironic in a way. It's like infinitely nested irony of the, using that term. But that's, right. that's like what they're, I wouldn't call them theologians necessarily, because it's not mm -hmm. theos or, uh, you, know what I, right. you know what I mean. Um, uh, yeah. But they're, metaphysicians have debated about forever because it every way that you talk about non-duality opens up um those into that same chasm of depending on dualistic thinking mm -hmm. and so then you have these really like subtle attempts at like untying the gordian knot of like samsara and nirvana are one right so Buddhism, right. the whole the religion, his entire purpose is to escape samsara, mm -hmm. but to deal with the non-duality problem, you have to say that they're actually the same thing, and that you right. can't actually escape it. Um, and so I don't know. That's a whole rabbit hole. But I guess yeah, going back I, to what you were saying with Platonists, well, okay, so that relates because of their idea of the one, which mm -hmm. you also see in the Iliadics. You're always dealing with that problem of multiplicity that is in the phenomenal world, right? And then it even comes out in the linguistic, in their own abstract world of thought, right? Yeah, so that's, I don't know if there's an easy way of articulating that, like, at all. So I think that is probably about, as well as you defining the territory. I mean, we could cover talking about, like, a lot of different, like, a lot of different kinds of systems. But it's it's, like, fundamentally, like, another way of thinking about this is, like, when we're talking about Neoplatonism or Plato in general, or you know, systems that sort of follow that line of thinking, they think from out of this one. And uh, actually, reading Heidegger's interpretation of Heraclitus, he actually argues that the Greeks think the other way around. Um, and by the Greeks, he mostly means Heraclitus, Parmenides, and Anaximander, where they're thinking from multiplicity toward unity, and that's why they're naming naming the Arche, right? Um, whereas it's kind of the other way around when you begin with the one and then you ask, how does, how does multiplicity arrive? Right. So I think Nietzsche's, Nietzsche's thinking, especially since he's going back prior to Plato and reconsidering the material of the pre-Platonics is sort of like a rediscovery almost of this, uh, of this other way of thinking. Um, that's where, you know, like a theologian like David Bentley Hart, for example, like he criticizes Heidegger for essentially just being a reiteration of paganism, right? Um, and so I, I just I find that whole thing interesting, which that might be a little bit of a, of, of a digression, but I think it's an interesting way of understanding the place out of which Nietzsche is thinking, if that makes sense, where like he's he's starting denying from the multiplicity being. and and so right. so. The the yep. unity starting that starting from becoming right, and then the unity that you mm -hmm. come up with out of that then 
you would think about that unity in a different way because like with Nietzsche you could say it's something like will to power, right? But mm-hmm. that's <laughs> it's will to power doesn't seem it's not like Nietzsche is starting from will to power and uh, deriving right. a world from it. It's like he's right. deriving will to power from the world. Um, and he right. knows and in it's that's, a representation uh-huh. of it. Right. And in that sense, will to power is a name for something multiple and also something moving and also something that has to do with appearance. Right. So that's where he's a complete flip of Plato and this like idealistic platonic worldview because he's he's thinking at, like almost literally the other way around. Hmm. Um, yeah. So so he, that's where, you know, by considering becoming first like which hadn't been done in quite some time um he arrives at these these uh interesting conclusions that we have a hard time wrapping our heads around because we're very well trained to think the other way around um more numerically and uh and in a certain sense reductively or maybe deductively um yeah and also induction is hard <laughs> <laughs> to do well yeah okay so Shall we go to the next, uh, or the end? Well, mm-hmm. it's not the end, but it's sort of like there's a paragraph. This page. Right? Yeah. So the, I think you left off with uh, assuming that either space or time is zero, right? Right. So that's what he ends up doing. So we, don't, I, we can move right into what he says about it. Um, if I assume space to be infinitely small, all distances between atoms become infinitely small, i.e. all punctual atoms coincide in one point, right? So this is, again, like I would say, I would call this personally like another way of thinking about it um, where the laws of space relate to this one, right? If you imagine them as infinitely small, they all kind of collapse together. Um, And that's, I don't even, I don't even want to like get into some of it because it's like I would, I personally would relate this to ideas like divine simplicity, right? Mm, Yeah. Um, Yeah. So, so. By assuming that space is zero or infinitely small, or I think zero in this case, there's no distances between atoms, right? Right. The, the distances become infinitely small, so there's no force and no motion. Right. It's uh, absolute non-persistence of being. Right. Right. Um, yeah, I would say infinitely small and zero. He's meaning those to be the same thing, right? It's like uh, mm-hmm. as in, as close. To yeah, well, infinitely would wouldn't even be as close to. That would be the wrong way to think about it. <laughs> like, mm-hmm. Right, um, no right. largeness at all. So absolutely right. no distance. Yeah, and you're getting a bunch of things here that also they go right into his uh, his critique of being. Because even as I'm thinking through, all punctual atoms coincide in one point. I mean, that is kind of like the unity of all things, right? Like multiplicity disappears in that coinciding in one point. Given that. If we're talking about the world, right, uh, an actual an actual space point rather than what he's drawn above is something that has dynamic qualities and motion. All of these things are getting getting in a certain sense like bled out <laughs> as you uh, as you compress um, the space atoms into one point, right? So that's almost even like assuming the origin. God, I'm like I'm like right on the edge. Like I'm right on the edge of not even being able to hold hold the thought together to a certain extent, right? But um, by assuming that space is infinitely small or zero, you're kind of also also from the sense of time assuming that it's the original point, right? It's so okay. So Nietzsche is he is saying we can have a coherent metaphysical position for this theory, given all mm-hmm. of the sort of issues that he's raised. If we do regard space right. as, as, as zero, as infinitely small, he then makes that make, <laughs> make sense of the world that we perceive with this second, with this paragraph underneath it, right? By introducing, it's really the, this is the time atomism, right? Is the next section. Right. Like, like the assuming that space is infinitely small and the distances, uh, the distances between atoms becoming infinitely small um, and showing that it's like motion motion and force really has to do with this transition between between space sorry between time between time points yeah yeah between moments in time right and not anything to do with 
them being properties of the space or in right. the, the object, right? The space ar- that's being taken up even. We've already we've already settled on the idea that the laws of space as we perceive them are simply representations. So there's no demand right. that any of that is actually real. From what we right. actually know of the world, we could exist in this one point in space. So yeah, well, yeah. Well, I mean, we I definitely that, that sounds kind of like, at a, least a, like we a weak exist ar- at this one point in time. Well, I mean, uh, I know that's like kind of sounds like a weak argument for it, but I guess what I'm just trying to to articulate there, mm-hmm. right, is that what he's saying sounds like I could hear somebody if they just were passively listening to this conversation saying like, well, what? That's like the primeval ad- primeval atom before the Big Bang, right? Of all matter condensed into mm-hmm. one point. But that's obviously not what we live in. We every there is distance between right. things. But <laughs> right, and there is there is motion. That's right. I think that's right. kind of the key here, which is that he's he does critique this uh, worldview um, that rests on some object that lacks motion. Right. So like a like a um, like a prima movens of a sort, like like the prime mover, the first cause. Right. So instead, what he wants to do, like he's articulating this idea of space equaling zero. To show that if we think instead that time equals zero, we reach a different conclusion. And actually, this conclusion is more in line with the rest of his philosophy in particular. Oh, okay. So you do think you think time... So he, That was sort of my question before. So he's saying either space or time equals zero. I was thinking he was saying space mm-hmm. would have to equal zero and time would have to, what would you say, exist as a real property? Um, or... <laughs> I don't know how to put it exactly. Um, or time equals yeah. one. <laughs> um, right. But you're saying you think you think more in line with his philosophy is space equals one and time equals zero? Or but they both equal zero? Well, I'm not sure about the one part, about okay. one of them equaling one. He's just, he's just imagining them each as like sort of infinitely small, right? Okay. Um, or like in its infinitely smallest points. I guess... He's about to do the reverse because he's going to p- talk about the infinite divisibility of time, which is taking time and breaking it up into smaller pieces. Whereas with space, we started from points and then we uh, we made them infinitely small, and and it was co- they they started to coincide, right? Yeah. <laughs> it says, but as okay, yeah. as time is infinitely divisible, the whole world is possible as a purely temporal phenomenon because I can copy every time point with the one space point thus being able to place it an infinite number of times. Therefore, one should see the essence of a body as distinct time points, i.e. the one point placed at certain distances. Between each time interval, there is still room for infinite time points. Therefore, if one could imagine a whole corpor- therefore one could imagine a whole corporeal world all furnished from one point, but in such a way that we bodies dissolve into interrupted timelines. And that is a pain in the ass there at the end. Um, <laughs> yeah, it's again the like last phrase is like, wait, what? I was, yeah, I was like, thought I was riding a tiger, um, and then, yeah. yeah. Um, <laughs> okay, but yeah, so making time infinitely divisible, I think this is where I do think he is going with this. That if we do away with the laws of space. Let's set aside the equaling mm-hmm. zero or equaling one thing, because I think he's trying to use yeah. that to be more clear, but I think it might confuse the issue. Um, yeah. So just using the idea of space, of imagining both of these things to be true, space infinitely small and time infinitely divisible. I'm trying very hard to like conceive of what he's saying here. Um, yeah. I, but because I have like an intuition of it, right, of... Okay, so there's no mm-hmm. space. All the quote unquote action, all of the appearance, all of the world, the whole corporeal world, um, whatever right. this event or experience is that's happening, what, what would you say? In between each interval, there's room for infinite time points. It's like, I mean, it's kind of the same matter just changing. Mm-hmm. It's all the same thing, right? But it's changing its uh, orientation or it's becoming a new appearance you're moving from moment one to two to three to four to five if space is infinitely small there is no point a and b right or there is but they're infinitely close to each other and so 
Right. And since in between each interval, there's room for infinite time points, almost like he's just doing away with the whole world of matter and saying, this right. is just one thing that in time is expressing itself in different states at every moment. But even calling them states is sort of wrong if you infinitely divide it. I don't know. Maybe you can rescue me here. Yes, yes. Yeah, the, <laughs> I, I, think, I think you're right with the infinite division, right? Infinite division, essentially, it makes a continuum, right? So it's like, it's like a movie has frames, right? Um, it's capturing frames of life, which does not have frames. Or we, but we can only think it in frames. What was it? I think, I think we might have discussed this at another point another point in time um that he says in one of his other notes that we cannot think becoming right we have to consider we have to consider becoming as one persistent dead state followed by another persistent dead state yeah that it's like that is what right. minds are thought and thinking about it mm -hmm. um, right yep but he but yeah he, so it's mm -hmm. almost by like through via negativa He's like hinting at the the flowing Heraclitus's flowing river behind that, you know, right? Um, and basically saying, but you still think of it like a snapshot of like here's the river in one moment, here's the river in the next moment. In reality, mm -hmm. that doesn't happen. Um, but and that sort of to me almost raises another question or problem in a sense with Nietzsche's philosophy is. Why is it that our thought process is so alienated from becoming, right? Right. Like why is the yeah. abstract world this world of being? Mm -hmm. And I guess Nietzsche kind of gets out of that with Bull of Power because it's like that enabled us through various ways of taking power over the world. Um, mm -hmm. And here, I don't mean the metaphysical world. I mean, or world in the metaphysical sense. I mean, like the natural ecosystem, you know. Yeah, even when we're talking about considering the considering the world as one one thing, right? Um, that does slow it down as as it being one motionless thing. It's right. It's slowed uh, slowed. It's slowed down. <laughs> I like to that. a point where it can be <laughs> slowed down. It's slow. Um, <laughs> it can be. Uh, it can be considered, right? It's like it's like in the consideration itself, right? In the reflection on it, because that's the reflection is in some sense, a reflection on the representation, right? There's things to be learned from that. Yes, that does give the opportunity to give more, uh, to sort, sorry, to gain power over different things in the world, or when considering the world as one whole thing, right? Power over the whole, at least as it's imagined. And even in the sense that, like, thinking of the world in terms of it being a whole is it's 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 like specifically related to the position of authority or like being on a height in a certain sense right when you climb up the mountain and you look down all of these all of these individual things sort of like converge into indistinction right well when you're in when you're in a city right you see and you're mm -hmm. underneath all the buildings and next to the roads and the sidewalks you see all the movement in it and then you go, if you were to go climb a mountain next to the city and you look down on it, it looks like a frozen painting. Right? What Nietzsche writes actually right after that, I think is really related mm -hmm. to what the direction we went with this. Because he says, quote, a reproductive being is necessary, which holds earlier moments of time beside the present. In this, our bodies right. are imagined, imagineered, or imagineered. Then there is no coexistence except in representation. All coexistence would be deduced and represented. Uh, Vorgestelt. The laws of space would be wholly constructed and would not guarantee the existence of space. Um, I guess I'll end the quote there. But it, the way that we imagine things, right, is in, in the way that we remember things. We hold earlier moments of time beside the present. What does that mean? Obviously, he's just referring to the faculty of memory, but he's pointing out it's like memories exist as these representations in that sort of sense that we've been talking about of like a frozen dead state. Mm -hmm. Right. You know, you remember individual sensations or collections of sensations or an image that's sort of frozen in time. They, and then he goes on to say, there's no coexistence except in representation. And you realize, I almost think what he's hinting at here or implying is that because we represent the world in that way, where we can hold different frozen moments, right? up mm -hmm. and compare them and reflect upon them in sort of a sequence yep. 
maybe that's why we think about space and matter the way that we do as yeah. um, causes, impulses, bodies, he said. Or, or yeah, as these coexistent different points of matter, right? Mm -hmm. um, that they're all these isolated things or objects or bodies, right? When yeah. he says um, the laws of space would be wholly constructed would not guarantee the existence of space. Yeah, just going back to the description he gives earlier when we were talking about space being infinitely small, time being infinitely divisible, it's like he's saying that from all the information we have, we only have the basis for distinguishing, what would you say, like these individual time points, time, uh, time atoms, mm -hmm. I guess you could say, and not mm -hmm. matter atoms. Right. Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Um, and so the, the fact that we think that those coexist with one another or... Yeah, it's very strange, though, because it is that we're in a place where there's no multiplicity or movement, technically. But in a way, it's almost like what you would conclude from this is that he's saying, well, no, what movement is, is actually this continual emergence of time atoms. <laughs> or, I don't know how to put it, movement from one time atom to another, that that's actually the movement that's happening? I think, I think he's saying, like, time atoms is a way of thinking about time right in a in a series like that's what he's saying is that we think time in a series of discrete moments but that's fundamentally different from looking at each individual thing and what the thing is made of yes what you you know what i mean and that's that's the you reach of you reach time at, mm -hmm. which is what a lot of philosophers did is like ask the question of what right. the substance of matter is sorry go on An another way of saying this is that is that so when we're thinking in terms of time atoms, right? We're thinking of a mobile, a mobile whole, right? So it's like it's like the unity formed from um, kind of like assuming that space is zero and all all things converging into one, but also still holding for it to have movement. Each thing we consider a distinct moment is a time atom, but everything in space belongs to that moment in terms of space, right? So like as a property, you know, as being uh, or like as a being. Yeah. And then the, I think, I think when we're talking about coexistence, that might also imply something like, you know, things in their, in their like considered as species of genera. You know what I mean? Cause mm -hmm. that's, that's a deduced, yeah, the, the deduced well, and represented the to a certain of degree. Unequal things again. Um, yeah. Right. Um, okay, so, and skip down a little bit. He says the reality of the world would then consist of a persisting point. Multiplicity would arise to the existence of representing beings which thought this point repeatedly in the smallest moments of time. Beings that do not assume the point to be identical at different time points and now accept these points as simultaneous. Uh, wow. Okay. Um, so the multiplicity happens through the existence of representing beings, which thought this point repeatedly in the smallest moments of time. Yeah, the beings themselves oh. can't be representations. Right. Um, right, right. So there is okay. a multiplicity <laughs> through which a multiplicity is arising. Right. But it's almost like... This is perspectivism. Right. That's... Okay. That's what it is. This is perspectivism. Um, representing beings, right? We're we're assuming the existence of representing beings, or you know that that uh, in some sense that which we are, at least as he's considering it. Um, in this, according to fragment eleven, right? I have nothing but sensation and representation. He's defining himself as this kind of sensing, representing being, and using that as the basis of his knowledge. Right. Yeah. Uh, as as his his perspective on on what he is, I guess, in this sort of like right, reductive kind of sense. Like, yeah, it's like so the, devours the premise almost. <laughs> right. Uh, yeah. So like multiplicity arises that the like multiplicity as a concept arises from there being more than one representing being. However, the reality of the world is a persistent point. Right. So I guess that's also like, and so the point that's like right. represented, like what's what's represented together, right? Which which in a certain sense is also what's sensed together. Yeah, although hmm, I'm almost 
I'm still trying to wrap my head around it, but it almost seems as if um, every being is exist. Every representing being exists in a sort of time monad within this persisting point. And what would you say? Would it be a there? I guess having a certain finite experience within this um, becoming point, but the actual yeah. I don't know, but the actual number of potential finite experiences is itself infinite. I don't know. Maybe even using experience, I'm wondering if it's the right way to say it. Um, yeah, I think when you say time monad, right, you're talking about being being something that senses and represents and holds uh, earlier moments of time beside right. the present. Yeah. You know what I mean? So, so that's that is what it is in us in the way that we're thinking, at least at this. At I need to stop saying at this point in time, it's really, really annoying. <laughs> um, <laughs> right, but it's like yeah, to do but, it, I, I'm like uh -huh. I'm like trying to do the same thing that that Nietzsche basically is suggesting <laughs> that our thinking is always sort of devolves into of like how do mm -hmm. I set all of these different beings that exist beside one another, um, right, as their own being. <laughs> and mm -hmm. you know make sense of that um uh, whereas yeah that's one of the things i love about this fragment by the way is that it feels like it's constantly escaping like your ability oh, yeah. to comprehend it fully oh absolutely but it's like that's I, the best thing about it but i can smell you have to chase the fragment the smoke right like i'm like mm -hmm. okay wow i'm there's something in the back of my intuition that sees what this is pointing at, but it's very hard to put it into words. Uh, it's one yeah. of those, like, uh, we must free ourselves from the tyranny of words type moments that mm -hmm. Nietzsche talks about. Exactly. Exactly. And that's where I would say, I don't know how I sound right now, but I know that I know what this means. <laughs> and I also <laughs> know that, you know, <laughs> I can't, I feel We're like just I trying to get it out of know it, but well, yeah, maybe it's I like know an it exercise. Like, yeah. It's like an, um, a priori knowledge. <laughs> so. Well, well, as as per uh, as per uh, Eke Homo, right? Uh, uh, why I write such excellent books? Uh, one never gets more out of things, uh, books included, than one already knows, right? That's that is something that he said. Yeah, that's learning is remembering. Plato, Nietzsche, and Plato can hold hands. Um, <laughs> right. <laughs> Okay, uh, so the next part, translation of all laws of movement into time proportions. Right. Interesting. I, yep. think, we're, I think that makes sense with what we're, mm -hmm. everything we've said. And then the essence of sensation would consist in gradually sensing and measuring such time figures ever more finely. Representation constructs them as a coexistence and explains the progress of the world according to this coexistence. Purely the transfer us into another language, into that of becoming. The order of the world would consist in the regularity of time figures, yet one would then certainly have to think of time as working with a constant force, according to laws which we can only interpret from the coexistence. Actio in distance temporis punctum, which means action through, would that be act, action through distance at a moment in time? Something like that? I believe so. Isn't that, isn't that, I'm surprised we haven't mis, uh, mentioned Boscovich once. Yeah, action at a distance, right? Well, mm -hmm. so this is, yeah, my read of this is that he's kind of taking Boscovichian force point particles, but translating it from space into time. Yeah. Which is, like the quote you read at the beginning, uh, very bizarre, and I don't know if I've heard anything like it in <laughs> all of Western thought. <laughs> but Which one? Oh, the, the, uh, the time atom... Theory or the idea of translating force point particles into time particles. Um, I've yeah. never uh, the the commenter on Nietzsche that you mentioned who oh, said there's right nothing right like moles it. gotcha yeah right yeah nothing at all no it's so the essence of sensation would consist in gradually sensing and measuring time figures ever mm -hmm. more finely. I mean I sorry what I was gonna say was that uh, was that I feel like in a certain sense, this ref, uh, refers back to the 
the part of the pre-Platonic philosophers, the lecture on Heraclitus that you were mentioning, and the uh, the exper the experiment with uh, pulse rates, mm -hmm. right? I think one of the reasons this is so difficult to conceive of. I mean, obviously, we're trying to freeze what is mobile into uh, into words and language, um, but I think when he's talking about movements um, and time figures, and I'm pretty sure he gets into this a little bit further down. Um, he's, I think he's, uh, he's trying to use the tempo of things, right? As what is it? It's like a, it's, if, it's almost like the tempo being, of, or the different experience of becoming, um, well, the tempo, the tempo at which a force moves is what makes it distinct, mm -hmm. right? So everything that we're used to measuring in terms of space and like describing its properties, right? Thinking in terms of reality. Yeah, it's reality, of course, properties. sharing its root word with realty. Oh, interesting. Okay. Right, like a like a realtor, yeah. right? So properties, right? We're talking about spaces, right? That's, <laughs> that's, that's interesting. I've never thought about that. What, properties. It's a little bit yeah, the same uh, thing. There's so many things that like even even the way that I uh, I try to interpret this some sometimes or like when I read that portion of it that uh the portion of my writing on this is that there's so many things where like when i say something where i'm like oh yeah being is related to the laws of space it's like well i've i've already looked at it in a certain kind of like uh like etymological lens where it's like if you look at okay normally we talk about we talk about um let's see things like substance right and substance means standing firm and reality which means property or wealth or uh attribute which is like to pay tribute to right mm, yeah <laughs> and 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 we end up talking about um um even like terms and limits right we're talking about boundaries right all of these are like there's it's it's almost like territorial language yeah terms. and so terminus yeah mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. yeah so the representation sorry the i don't want to use representation in this context because we're talking about it but being as being better represented by space than anything else. When I talk about absolute space or like even abstract space, um, that's, that's kind of coded in the language a little bit, um, which is at least one way of like, yeah, I don't think thinking from where that. Nietzsche's thinking from. Yeah, yeah. That all the, this terminology for being has to do with space and that space and property and, uh, in territory a, in a way, this is just another, this passage is just another experiment, right? Because it, mm -hmm. it, it's daring you to take the step of, okay, stop solely thinking about it in terms of space, which is what you normally do consciously or unconsciously and solely think about it in terms of time. Right. Um, which is, it is very difficult because, um, you know, it's like almost a truism, but, uh, your language shapes thought and, <laughs> like you have no and i just use the term shapes so right that's like thinking of our thoughts in like physical terms of space and so it's language like, affects thoughts <laughs> right you could say uh yeah um language progresses into thoughts of a certain uh time configuration or a certain <laughs> uh tempo you could say um yeah yeah wow okay um and then he says, in itself, we have no way of putting a time law in place. Which, this probably has a lot to do with what we were just talking about. Um, yeah, yep. Yeah, time proves the absolute non-persistence of a force. Like, to put a law, put a time law in, well, in place, right? Um, to put a time law in place, it just, it doesn't... It, in place, it, yeah. It doesn't make sense. Like, time, time, <laughs> time is like an absolute, absolute um, force in this case. Right, as opposed to absolute space. Yeah, okay, so then we would then have a punctual force which would have a relation to every later time moment of its existence, i.e. the forces of it would consist of those figures and relations. In every smallest amount, the force would have to be different, but the sequence would be in any proportions, and the existing world would consist of the coming into visibility of these force proportions i.e. translation into the spatial. So, right. is that translation into representation, basically? Um, yes, of 
of force proportions, which essentially would, I think, is better uh, covered by the term intensities, right? Intensities of sensation translates into the spatial. Well, and the way, because we kind of touched on Boscovich when you brought him up, but just to, Mm -hmm. I think, bring that in without getting too deep into it, that Boscovich has a single equation for describing how all forces, like basically all matter, everything in physics, right, would um, Mm -hmm. sort of manifest. And so um, it's very hard to describe how exactly that is, but basically... It, he does it according to distance, right? Uh, the distance at which right. the force a- acts manifests it in a different way. And so at different distances, um, again, in space, you could have, if you think about it spatially, um, you know, the same underlying equation represents itself um, in terms of gravity or in terms of a sound wave or whatever. Um, mm-hmm. But if we're thinking about it in terms of time, right? Like you were saying intensity. So we have this sort of scale of very intense and you could say fast of the least duration, most distinct right? to Mm -hmm. most, uh, most duration and least distinct. And that on that scale or spectrum, which is still spatial thinking again, uh, but that's the only way I can conceive of it at this current moment. <laughs> um, you get a different... I don't know if we have the language. Right, you would get a different... So Nietzsche is saying, he's asking us to imagine that that's what's actually going on in the world, right? Is like the Boscovician mm-hmm. single equation or single pattern of forces that at different intensities in time or for force proportions... Uh, is translated into the spatial, which is only in our representation of it in a different way. Mm-hmm. Right. Um, yeah. Yeah. I, that's clearer to me stuff, than honestly. anything we've talked about <laughs> so far, but it's also completely yeah. inconceivable. But sorry, <laughs> yeah. what were you saying? No, I was just saying uh, pretty simple stuff, right? Yeah, and yeah, yeah absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. <laughs> Do we want to, I mean, we might as well just... Uh, finish out this last section right are we going to go to the end yeah um and i i think the chart i'll post this in like the show notes or the whole oh, that'd be cool the, like that his little diagram that he drew um oh and i guess we should probably just read off the thing he says at the end um mm-hmm. but um did you want to take a reading or, or move or was there anything yeah. in the upcoming yeah. section you want to um, I just say um, it's so the next section is uh, in atomic physics, one assumes atomic forces to be unchangeable in time, uh, thus onta um, in the Parmenidean sense, but these cannot be effective, right? So again, we're talking about like like ta onta is like beings, right? So each each like each in atomic physics, one assumes that small I guess small forces are well. Okay, he's calling them forces. So let me just uh, let me just distinguish that, right? So he's talking about it in terms of forces. But when we're talking about atoms and in in to- atomic physics, we're talking about beings which are unchangeable in time, right? Like atoms are kind of a, a like a kind of being, um, a certain kind of unity, and that's where I think, if I remember correctly, in genealogy of morals. Um, he talks about, um, he's like, and, and your Adam, uh, dear scientists or, you know, something like that. Um, which, so it falls under his general critique of, of being, um, so he says instead, yeah, he says only, uh, only absolutely changeable forces can be effective of the sort that are not the same for one moment. So, yeah. Okay. Yeah, they. You have to have that movement from a one to a two, basically. Right. Um, no change is no effect. Right. So, um, yeah, only changeable forces can be effective. So, all forces are only a function of time. Um, Which that follows yeah. then from that. Yeah. Right. I think. I think he goes. He goes from saying, if I remember correctly, he goes from saying all forces are only a function of time to saying that, I believe he says that time is not 
is also at the same time not one thing, right? There's no there's no steady time, at least. Time isn't something steady, is another thing that he says, though. So it's usually, like, he even has a different way of thinking about time than we do, which, I mean, given the eternal recurrence of the same and other, you know, like, other, the just, like, the not, denial of being, which is related to, for example, almost always, like, an origin and even the critique of reason, I feel like one of my favorite things about this passage is that experimental or not it's not just i feel like sometimes when when we think about this as an experiment we think of it as something that might not apply to the rest of his philosophy but it is a really interesting idea that comes out of all of the rest of his philosophy so it's absolutely worth considering if you already are i don't i don't know are are convinced or see see things the way that he does or you know have have a certain affinity for his ideas. Um, yeah, I, I would, I, I think that's important to bring up, and I, and I should, should specify when I say he's thinking experimentally. Like, I think I'm using it more in the sense of like when Nietzsche talks about future philosophers being experimenters, of actually mm-hmm. ra- he's raising a dangerous question in some sense that he actually. Yeah. <sighs> he can't have knowledge of the quote unquote truth of what he's talking about, but the by implication, we should understand that our materialist understanding of the world, we don't have any more of a basis for it than he does for what he's talking about. At least when you get into like actually like strict epistemological concerns, right. Um, of the kind he's talking right. about, he says, oh, okay. An effect of a sequence of time moments is impossible for two such time moments would coincide. Um, thus every effect is actio in distance, i.e. through jumping. That's where it gets really crazy to me. So it's time is atomized here, infinitely divided, but it's not even a progression, really. Um, right. It's like jumping. Uh, it's like his entire theory almost is like dependent on not <laughs> on everything. Every it goes against every assumption that we sort of have, I guess, right? That um, yeah, it's like jumping through time moments. It's not that you have to proceed from one to the other to the other to the other. That's sort of, I guess, how he's dealing with the problem of motion, right? Um, is that mm-hmm. oh no, we just jump like from well, one to the other, like yeah, and all of your numerical division of it is you trying to impose a time law, maybe. Because it's infinitely divided yeah. already. Um, I don't know. Well, that's the that's the imposition of a space point, right? Yes. On time. So when he considers the whole as as space, right, and then that whole is in some sense or another a moment, then rather than um, rather than being, right, or like existence. So instead of thinking of the whole of everything spatial in terms of existence. He's taking that and turning that into uh, a moment, right? That's a moment when laid side by side becomes an atom of time. So I think this actually ends up being, so I don't know, I guess the part that I can't square and it has kind of been keeping me stuck in my writing is figuring out um, how this relates to the existence of representing beings, right? Mm Mm-hmm. Which of which of course would make sense because in a certain sense when you think of everything in space as this one moment that can be placed an infinite number of times on a time point, you you get because you're conceiving of it as a whole, right? You're getting essentially a fatal worldview, right? The moment, like all the all the spatial relations are locked together in the moment in a certain sense, but they're always tied together through this placement Mm. right i mean honest okay so the most there's no magical element of free will the most magical thing is this action at a distance that jumps and he says in the next section how an effect of this kind and distance is possible we do not know at all which i kind of love because Mm. right um it's very honest and it brings us back to i don't know um having some mystery or humility about <laughs> the the great yeah. mystery that we live in um but it's that i would also struggle to see how it relates to i think really the most immediate 
effect that I think this has or would relate to my life as a being within <laughs> this um, time atomism that's nevertheless representing it in spatial terms is that it frees you from the dogmatism of thinking in spatial terms. Um, right. Yeah, and I think that dogmatism is inherent in thinking in spatial terms. Dogmatism is in some sense inherent to thinking, right? I think um, not to not to this won't be the kind of uh, the kind of political commentary that needs to be edited out. But um, Goethe says in uh, in one of his maxims, he says uh, he loves to hear people, um, and I'm paraphrasing, of course. He loves to hear people. Uh, let's see speak empty words about liberal ideas. Mm -hmm. And then he says that ideas are not liberal. Right. Mm -hmm. So it's, you kind of come under possession of an, I've of an, of an idea. Right. Yeah. So, so in a certain sense, they can't be liberal. That's not what it means, but anyway, <laughs> yeah, no, I, 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 that's a, that's a really subtle, uh, dig. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yeah, the idea becomes yeah, like so an, I, uh, part of your identity. Sorry, go, go on. Mm -hmm. No, I was just going to say, you know, so from that last part, that uh, that second bullet point that you were in, and uh, and kind of the commentary on the humility and mystery in it, that's the same thing that I love about this conversation, for example, which is that we're literally sitting here thinking through this together. And no, we don't. We know, but we don't know. And that's, you know, not necessarily an easy thing to just admit. Yeah, well, and also anybody who, like claims they have a perfect understanding that they can explain to you of i i would love to see the uh, eli5 of of the time atom fragment from anybody who wants to step up <laughs> right give me the give me the weltgeist video about it um right right um no hate to weltgeist i like him um but you know you, you're not gonna you're not gonna summarize this in 15 minutes it's just impossible um no not it, at all it would be you would sound like either a raving madman or um, you would have to oversimplify it to the point where it's incorrect. Um, yeah. Okay, so the last, the third bullet point says fast, slow, etc. in this whole type of effect, i.e. the forces as functions of time. Those <laughs> be forces meaning beings, but also forces um, depending on how they, how distinct they are or their tempo. Um, okay, so he says, they express themselves in relations of near or distant time points, namely fast or slow. So how... Very interesting, because it's not a progression, so it's... How intensely your force is experienced over... Like, leaping over the most time points in order to <laughs> uh, create yeah. action, I guess? I'm... Oof. Yeah. <laughs> so the highest acceleration would lie in the effect of one time moment on the next, i.e. it would then be infinitely great. The greater the slowness, the greater the intervals of time, the greater the distance. Therefore, the relation of distant right. time points is slowness. All slowness is, of course, relative. <laughs> uh, yeah, the highest acceleration lying in the effect of one time point on the next. That's just kind of a... Uh... That's like the same thing we were saying about space points in the beginning. Space points taking the least amount of time points makes their effect the most, uh, sorry, makes them the most effective and also the most distinct, right? But then the what he's saying is the highest acceleration is between time points, like without, without any consideration of space then, because it's all force, right? And there is no actual time point that's a product of the representing being to a certain extent. And I guess in, in a certain extent, our, our slowness in comparison to time. Yeah. So is he saying the acceleration is infinitely great? Yeah, I think so. Okay. So yeah, you, the highest, the highest acceleration. So the highest speed is okay. between time points, a AKA that's the highest speed because it's actually a flow. Right. Okay. That's that's what I was getting at. But it's it's infinitely mm -hmm. great because you can't actually divide it into individual points. Right. It's accelerating at an infinite rate, which means wow. Okay. Um. All right. Well, 
let's so I'll read the end of this and then we can maybe mm-hmm. talk about some final thoughts. Um, Perfect. where he says we can only speak of t- time points or how about this? Do you want to I'll read the first part and then uh you mm-hmm. read the the 1 2 3 at the end? Sure thing. Okay. So Nietzsche says, quote, we can only speak of time points, no longer of time. The time point has an effect on another time point, thus dynamic characteristics to be assumed. Time atom theory. It is possible. And then he... It is possible, one, to reduce the existing world to punctual atomistic space. Two, to reduce this again to atomistic time. Three, the atomistic time ultimately coincides with a theory of sensation. The dynamic time point is identical with the sensation point, for there is no simultaneity of sensation. Yeah, and that, that actually grounds it at the end in a way that's easier to grab onto somehow of what he's talking about with the time point. Mm-hmm. as a When we take it out of the abstract and put it in our subjective experience as a sensation point. And then you could think about the duration and the intensity of sensations. Um, right. And how that affects their distinctness. Um, right. And how. And that's what turns them into representations. Yes. Yeah. And that all of the things that then. Well, because like sensation on the basic level, right? You could, like, I burn my hand on the stove, right? That's an mm-hmm. intense. Um, that's an intense sensation. Um, and there will be no simultaneity with it because that will completely take up your attention, right, when it happens. Right. Um, you can sort of only have one sensation at once. Um, but then the mailman is also a sensation, right? He's a bunch of light hitting your retinas. Um, right. And so... <laughs> um, yeah. Damn, mailman. Yeah, yeah. You're just a sensation, dude. Um, <laughs> uh, I think the only there was one there was one last thing that I thought you might find interesting um, that might pertain to this. One of my favorite philosophers, other than Nietzsche, or actually probably I would say secondary to Nietzsche, if I had to rank them, is uh, Ludwig Klages. And uh, in one of his aphorisms, he talks about the unreality of the future, and in talking about it. He conceives of of time in terms of space to a certain degree where, um, I guess, what is it? How, how would I describe this? Like, the, the past is a distance, and then, oh, what is it? There's no future because the now is, like, here, right? And so, and so um, in that distance, necessarily, um, all... All things are all things that have happened are unified in that distance and distinct from the in the moment that they're experienced. And I think that kind of relates to this, but I don't I don't know how to tie it together. No, that I yeah, it's like we're like on the bleeding edge of reality, like pushing into <laughs> non being and creating right. being with our representations mm-hmm. of it, which we're yeah, right. Yeah, okay. Well, uh, on that note, I think we can uh, wrap it up here. Um, All right. But again, uh, it's been great. I'm glad we decided to do this. It, um, like I said, I'll put up the diagram in the show notes, and I think again, it it's a way to shake ourselves out of our dogmatism about certain things um, and remind us of <laughs> what we don't know. Um, <laughs> right. But. Uh, did you have uh, any plugs, any shout outs, anything you wanted to say at the end or um, before we, um, well, I, I don't have uh, I don't have anything out now. I have a bunch of uh, projects that are probably going to hit all at once. Um, I uh, just been kind of working my way through them in a nonlinear fashion. Um, but um, ring of return uh, dot substack dot com well that will be uh populated with some things eventually so <laughs> cool that's my point not at this time uh, not at this time not this particular uh time point all right well quinn uh, <laughs> it's been really good um all right and, thanks uh, yeah thanks for coming on and goodbye everybody all right.